Uh, if you don't know Jean, she's been a friend to this cause for many years, even before I really knew anybody in the field. And uh, your website is breakthroughpower.net. And uh, Jean is the author of a book, Breakthrough Power, which you can get on Amazon, or you can get, I think she may even have a couple copies with her here that she'd be happy to talk to you about, you know, out in the other room. And um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, let's see. How do you want to start this? Okay, so, um, okay, so to my right, I just introduce everybody on online. Okay, to my right is uh, Mark McKay. Uh, he gave the talk on the uh, uh, EV Gray uh, information that he's recently come across. Um, we have John Polakowski who gave a presentation on the cosmic induc uh, induction generator. We have Eric Dollard who's going to be giving his presentation uh, after this, uh, after we have a break. It's going to be kind of a long one and in intense. I know I helped put over 300 slides. Uh, together in a PowerPoint, and then Jeff helped work out the rest, so it's going to be pretty intensive, which will be on the extraluminal transmission systems of Tesla and Alex Anderson. Uh, I gave a talk on the plasma ignition and some of the HHO nitrogen stuff. Uh, we have uh, Jim Murray, who, together with Paul Babcock, gave a talk on using reactive power as energy and did the SERPs demonstration. Then we have Peter Lindemann, who uh, gave a talk on the uh, Bedini SG, basically a preview of what's come in the uh, advanced book that we're going to try to put out in August. And then, uh, so if you want to take it from there, we have a couple mics here that's available. And at some point, uh, Gene will be opening up some questions from the audience. And we have somebody with a microphone so that uh, we can hear the questions really good. Now, we were talking at lunch, and we were curious where everybody heard about this wonderful conference. Um, how many heard about it on the Energetic Forum? Quite a few. And otherwise, just a random search of the internet looking for energy conferences, anybody? A few. And um, word of mouth. Yeah, any, any other sources uh, I may have forgotten to? Email. Email. Email those. Yeah, yeah. That's word of mouth, isn't it? Okay, the first, uh, we're going to ask a few questions of the panel and then we'll open it up to the uh, audience for questions. Um, I wanted to ask everybody if you have some advice for newbies. You know, say there's some talented young person that uh, finds out about this field and uh, wants to make a difference in the world. Um, this time we'll start on Peter's end of the... <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, you know, all seriousness aside, um, <laughs> um, yeah, if, you, if you've got, if you're new in this field and, and, and feel, you know, called, you know, uh, in, you know, from the inside, you know, to work in this field, which is the same disease that we all have, um, you know, we, um, we sympathize. Uh, <laughs> You know, our, our, uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to your family. Um, <laughs> but honestly, I think this is one of the most exciting times to get into it. It was, uh, it was really anticlimactic when we all got <laughs> into it because uh, um, we thought this was a really cool thing and we found out as we got into it, it was an ice cold river flowing in the opposite direction we thought it was going. So, um, uh, we've, uh, um, we're, o we're only here simply because our health outlasted uh, the rest of the, the ordeal. And, um, um, but anyway, uh, I think this is uh, the most exciting thing that uh, people can be doing. I think the, the impact for the future uh, is, is one of, going to be one of the largest that uh, history will record. Uh, Tesla said that uh, when uh, the day that the humans uh, actually understand what electricity is will be the greatest day in history. And um, I think we're really approaching that. Uh, we're really certainly, even if we don't know exactly what it is, we're really starting to understand what it does and how it does it. And uh, that may suffice for the next stage. And um, um, anyway, uh, welcome.
persevere, persevere, persevere. You're going to get beaten with clubs. You're going to get laughed at. You're going to get kicked. Take no prisoners. <clears throat> it's combat. Get used to it. But it's fun as could ever be. It, it gets in your blood worse than fly fishing. That's all I can say. <laughs> I, it, if I'm not doing it, I'm not happy. Because I know, you know, real human happiness is when you're creating value for the others you live with. And <clears throat> love for planet Earth, love for my fellow human beings, even though at times, like Einstein said, Einstein said, there's only two things that are infinite, and that's human stupidity in the universe, and he wasn't so sure about the universe. <laughs> but other than that, all that aside, you know, uh, it's about no matter what kind of technology we create, what kind of discoveries we make, we have to open minds. And that's what we're trying to pass on to you guys, is maybe you don't know much about electronics or physics, but in your hearts, I know you get the truth of it. So spread the word. Yeah. And, you know, that's what I have to say. Well, I agree with Paul <clears throat> in most everything he said. The uh, most important thing is perseverance. There's no question about that. But along with perseverance, you have to also have the realization of the fact that one of your biggest, most complex chores is going to be to undo what you think is real or to re-educate yourself. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to strip away the programming that is implanted from childhood about the restrictions and the uh, taboos and uh, just go by the heart meter, the truth meter inside you, and then back that up by intense experimentation. And by all means, don't be afraid to be wrong. There isn't anybody that's always right, and uh, nobody's going to laugh at you, especially if you're doing this in the basement with the, with the windows blacked out. <laughs> I can tell you all about that sometime. But anyhow, yeah, it's very important to persevere. And uh, it's also very important to realize this. The entire culture, and I almost hesitate to use that word because I'm not so sure we have achieved culture, but the entire culture that we recognize as a way of life is directly linked to the availability of energy slash power. And um, everybody knows, or pretty much everybody knows, that um, fossil fuels are not only uh, getting harder and harder to, to find and to process and what have you, but uh, they're also wrecking the environment. So if we as a species want to continue, then we're going to have to find some alternative. And there's good benefits that come with finding an alternative over and above the idea of preserving the planet. If we start to detach ourselves from our uh, dependence upon fuels, then we're also going to be cutting the larger miseries out of the human race that have held us back for a very long time. And I don't have to elaborate on that. I don't think there's a person in the room that doesn't understand what that statement means. So anyway, you persevere. You uh, do away with your, uh, your programming and try to see the truth for what it really is. And uh, you also have to be willing to work your buns off because nobody's going to do it for you. And sometimes it's extraordinarily frustrating. And it's also very expensive. So you have to be ingenious enough to come up with ways of funding whatever it is you want to do. And that's not always easy. But the rewards are well worth it. There's no high like seeing the theory that you're working towards uh, being verified in reality. And with that, I'll pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, there's not really a lot that I can really add to these inspirational messages here because I believe and uh, feel the exact same way these guys do. I have not had as long of uh, experience in this field as they do, but 
Uh, very simply, one thing is to forget about other people's opinions. A lot of people uh, have their own opinions and it kind of sets people on, an, on a wrong track. They, and as soon as you give in to these skeptics who say it can't be done, then they're making your choices for you and you don't have any power. And so, and just simply, as far as getting into these technologies, um, do what I do. I surround myself by guys, you know, all these fine people here that uh, actually have working models and, you know, they don't just talk, they actually build things that work. And so, um, that's the reason you see the very specific people at this conference that you do. So, other than what they, ha they had to say, this about as simple as that. Well, I'm not much of a subscriber to romanticism. All I can say is I don't know how to do anything else. No matter how much you kick the coyote in the head, it's still going to eat chickens. <laughs> I'm going to give some more uh, practical advice. I. <laughs> I would say uh, most of you who came here um, are probably trying to either learn how to build something or want to become more informed or um, just trying to learn something. I would say if you're trying to learn more about the energy field, dive in with both feet. Don't half-ass it. Um, that's what I did five years ago, and here I am giving a, a presentation with Eric. Um, I was you know, just conventionally educated at college. But uh, I, I dove in with both feet with Eric's material and uh, learned quite a bit. So <clears throat> it's hard work. It's going to take a lot of your time. And you're going to have to decide how badly you want it and how important it is to you. But uh, the rewards are definitely worth it. So we're talking to a few people out here that have just decided that they're going to explore this wide area of interesting uh, human endeavor. So um, you got to figure that there's got to be over 4,000 different approaches to this uh, free energy over unity concept. Uh, there's hydrogen, there's electromagnetics, there's electrostatics, there's uh, gravity wells, all kinds of stuff. I mean, Peter's probably an expert in six of these already that I know of. Uh, I have a friend of mine named Graham Gunderson who's an expert in magnetics, and uh, that's got 20 or 50 different variations that he studies. It appears to me that uh, a new person to this vast field needs to prune the tree and focus on one particular area that really gets them juiced. For me, that's the EV grade technology, which is an electrical process, but there's a lot of others out there. Uh, Aaron's into converting water into carbon monoxide and, and uh, burning it through a jet engine. That's another thing, that's chemistry. And there's all kinds of things with um, uh, cold fusion and also burning hydrogen and catalyzing it and doing more over with it. So. First of all, just read the whole field uh, with the, the magazines and blogs and postings, but eventually somewhere in there you're going to find some particular concept that's going to uh, pull your trigger. Then you got to put together for yourself a self-educated uh, program as to how you're going to learn the technology of that particular uh, area of research, whether it's chemistry, whether it's gas, whether it's gravity, or in my case, um, uh, electronics. Essentially, um, you're self-taught in this particular field. You're not going to learn anything in the uh, academic schools, but they do provide the basic tools of understanding how to use instrumentation and at least something that the masters in the past have figured out about physics. If, if I were to start this program with my particular expertise, an example would be to um, start with a basic electronics manual from a technical school or off the internet and study that thing from front to back so you know all the terminology, all the words, all the basic principles and all the basic algebra equations. Once you got that down, can speak the language, understand what's going on, know the difference between a watt and, and a joule, then you're ready to start understanding what these other people have to say. Then I'd go and buy Peter's books on the SG motors, study them from front, front to back. Then I would study uh, all the basic uh, stuff that's done by Tesla. 
and then dig into whatever it is your particular foundation or interest would be. This would be kind of the program I'd recommend for somebody starting out. But if you do it in chemistry or something else, then you put together your own program. But it's all going to be hard work. And then none of this is going to go into fruitation until you actually do something with it. You've got to find your own space, collect your own tools, get your instrumentation, save money from your recycled aluminum cans, and start buying the parts and pieces necessary to do basic experiments in whatever it is you think it is. Um, there's far too many people on the internet that post on the blogs that are primarily, I call, coffee shop physicists. They got this theory, they got that theory, they got this idea, they want to throw this out, but none of them have put two wires together and, and, and watched their $4 transistor burn up. <laughs> so whatever it is, it's, it's got to be a hands-on type uh, endeavor. Anyway, that's kind of a general direction here. Okay, um, I think just one more question from, from my perspective before we turn it over to the audience. Um, Paul Babcock had mentioned Tesla's quote about um, 21st century is, is going to be his, his century, yep. right? Um, what's happened here really gives me a lot of hope, um, the wonderful progress that, that these gentlemen are, are making and uh, all the technologies that have been presented here from uh, John Bedini's, um, William Lyne's uh, atomic hydrogen work, um, where everybody is, um, it, it all gives me hope that things are moving ahead. But I know that on the panel we have, you know, our spectrum of where you stand on the, on the continuum from hope to despair or despair to hope. Um, but still, I'd like to ask the panel members if um, what, what, they, what they see as moving things forward right now in our time or what's coming that, that can really move these things forward so that, um, so that this pensioner doesn't have to pay a $900 <laughs> utility bill, you know, so that things are going to change within my, the time I have left. Um, what do you see as, as moving things forward? I think I'll just let you um, volunteer to, to speak on it. Anybody? Uh, well, I've been in, in this field for 40 years, and uh, when, we, you know, when we first started out, um, you know, no one would tell you anything. Uh, the, the inventors all kept all their secrets, and uh, uh, you know, somebody starting out uh, with an interest in this field basically was just stonewalled and told nothing, shown nothing, uh, you know, uh, not given any pointers, uh, doing a, a patent search was available at, at 10 locations across the country. I mean, it, was, it was impossible to find anything out. So we've obviously moved into a completely new era with the, uh, the internet. Uh, you can do a patent search for, on anything uh, worldwide from your living room. Uh, you can, you, you, you've been, we've all been given tools to find out a staggering amount of stuff. And the internet is full of things that are really important and even fuller of things that are complete nonsense masquerading as important things. And so um, we've moved from the, 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 the period where um, you know, it was very, very difficult to, to find out anything to the period that I um, um, like to call the bury them in bullshit era, OK? So um, you, you need to really um, hone your kind of own internal sense of what's true. When, when you run into something that's true, it just feels different to you. And, and, and it's really, really important that you hone that particular sense in your conscious energy field, um, because that's going to be the thing that is really the most important. Um, I am essentially 100% hopeful um, about uh, the future. Um, I know that the human race is, is much older than the books say, and that means that the humans lived through at least the last two ice ages with nothing more than skins and, and fireplaces. So um, I'm not worried about the human race surviving anything that, that can be thrown at it. 
Um, and what that means is, is that um, I think we're moving towards an era where the, the scientific um, discoveries are really going to change the distribution of power um, uh, from very, very small groups of people having power over almost everybody to a, a different distribution. And, and, and what that means is, is that people's differences and, and creativity are going to have more uh, energy to express themselves. And so what that's going to require from all of us is that we are more tolerant of each other's um, uniquenesses, OK? And while we find even greater reasons to cooperate with each other, even if we don't like each other. Uh, because if those are the things that are going to make all of this possible. If we, if we stay small-minded about um, uh, people getting you know, uh, the fruit of their own labor, um, then um, things aren't going to change. And the very, very small group of people who have who've kept us all from uh, learning things uh, will remain in the, in the position of highest leverage. And um, so I think uh, as this technology explodes on the scene, it's going to require us to um, become remarkably and um, even generously tolerant of, um, of our differences and, and, and people's um, ability to express their differences in a, in a stronger and more forceful way and that we have to be tolerant of that of others, um, even as they will have to be tolerant of us doing the same thing. Well said. I'd like to add a little, I'm kind of a student of history. It's a subject that's always fascinated me. And after reviewing the last, I don't know, 5,000 years of history, I'd say that human beings are better and smarter than they've ever been, no matter when you look at the macro problems we have in this world. And I really believe that we're well into a new renaissance and enlightenment. And it's growing exponentially every day. And if you look back in history to Leonardo's time, another great mind, something always seems to happen when things are at the toughest, back in the Middle Ages, wars, plagues, famine, history, it, it was almost a mirror of our time. It was a horrible time. People were slaughtering each other, diseases, uh, on and on and on. Political intrigue, religious and political suppression, uh, all the things we see today. And, and during those periods, that's when the greatest minds come out of nowhere. It's like they incarnate into our world and they lead us into a new direction. And that's happening all over their planet. There's incredible minds popping up everywhere. And they're changing the entire mass, pro mass thought process like we've never seen in history. With the internet, our communications, the world is really heading toward a great place. Uh, we're going to be, uh, as you can see, our institutions, we see all our problems with religious institutions, political institutions, they're falling apart before our eyes. That's just part of the Renaissance process. We're on to a new enlightenment, and we're all involved with it. That's why we're all here. So this is just part of that enlightenment, and out of it's going to come tremendous knowledge, spiritual growth, and I'm really looking forward to the 20-hour work week because we don't have to work so hard to have, a, have something. Did you go to France and have that right now? Yeah. <laughs> but with that, being able to release ourselves, you know, uh, from the old biblical term, by the sweat of your brow, you shall have your meat. We'll be able to raise our kids better. We'll be able to pursue spiritual, uh, spiritual pursuits, artistic pursuits. You know, this thing that's coming is going to free us to go to places we haven't even imagined yet. And that includes the universe, space, you name it. You know, we're explorers, we're travelers, we're, we, we love to play, 
human, the human race are like the sea otters of the universe. You know, I mean, we really are. Human beings are just incredible creatures. And uh, we're going to some great places. I couldn't agree more with what my two comrades have said. But I look at things from a slightly different perspective, so I might as well deliver this little message from an unusual point of view also. The uh, subject that interests me a great deal over and above physics and mathematics is alchemy. And the interesting thing about alchemy is if you ask 99% of the people what it was all about, they'll say, oh, you had a bunch of nuts trying to make lead into gold. But in reality, that's actually nothing to do with alchemy. It's a very, very small part of the whole subject. And what alchemy really stands for is a methodology, um, a way of life, and a meditation process that accelerates evolution of the spirit. And evolution of the spirit actually corresponds directly to quantum leaps in consciousness. And all of the things that these two gentlemen have just outlined, especially the internet and all of the wonderful changes that are occurring on the planet, uh, all represent new plateaus of consciousness. You know, this is supposed to be the age of Aquarius, the opening of secrets and the, uh, the dawn of a whole new way of looking at things. And to me, that's what it's all about. I mean, we come here and people spend years trying to figure out what their purpose is in life. Gee, maybe I should be a lawyer, maybe I should be a painter or a fireman or a cop or whatever the deal is, but that's not really what it's all about. What it's really about is this planet, which is one of hundreds of millions of other planets, is nothing more than a big schoolroom. And we have to start to realize that our primary objective here is to learn. And not only to learn for the purpose of selfishness, which is a good thing in that respect, but also to learn about the intricacies and the wonders of creation, to perceive reality from our own individual perspective, and then to integrate those experiences into a contribution to make to the planet and to our fellow man. So that in reality, each one of us winds up standing on the shoulders of giants and doing wonderful things with our lifetimes. This is a really important thing because I don't believe any human being on his deathbed wants to look back and say, damn it, I spent all these years surviving just so I could croak. <laughs> all of us want to do something more than that. and. Uh, I think that this, these times are times in which we can achieve just that. Thank you. These gentlemen are, are speaking to my heart. Um, I had a banner made for my book, Breakthrough Power, and on the bottom it said, uh, the energy revolution and the consciousness revolution must arrive hand in hand. Aaron, I'm sure you have. Um, I tend to get a little bit long-winded on uh, my opinions about uh, consciousness and elevating our awareness, and uh, a lot of it has to do with who's really doing the thinking inside here. Um, usually I have a, probably keep a lot of it to myself. <laughs> but there is a saying going around that mass hypnosis obviously works, uh, and we see it around uh, you know, in the world around us. Um, I don't know if I want to go too much into that, really, but yeah, uh, but. Well, just because thoughts are going through our minds doesn't mean that we're thinking, and uh, people think they do. People tend to be, you know, and I include myself in it. But it's just that if we know that we are doing it, then we can kind of be aware of that and catch ourselves. But um, most people spend their lives literally sleepwalking in a trance. You know, if you look at a zombie apocalypse movie, that's kind of a metaphor for what really is going on. There's a handful of awake people running around from all the, sleep, uh, the sleeping uh, zombies. 
And uh, so we have to kind of uh, see who really is doing the thinking because, you know, there is the real reality that we're living in, and then there's the, you know, illusion that we turn it into based on the words and meanings uh, that we assign to things. So instead of um, seeing things as they are, we have to catch ourselves when we are twisting it into something else. Um, you know, I've, you know, Peter and I have actually gone quite a great deal into that. We actually have a couple books that, uh, you know, that kind of walk people through processes to kind of snap people out of that. One of the things is called idiomotor trance, um, which a lot of people are walking around in. Not many people really know what it is, not even psychologists. But if you look at, um, for example, you come across a skeptic, and even if you show them the proof, they keep going on this autopilot mode where they just keep going back to, you know, backing, trying to back up what they already believe instead of actually looking at what you're, what you're talking about because they can't see something as it is. They keep trying to turn it back into what they want it to be. And so, um, you know, knowing those distinctions in uh, how our carnal reasoning mind is turning stuff into something that is not is um, crucial for um, being able to, you know, advance not just in the energy stuff but in consciousness itself. Um, you know, if you take a look at the library that Peter and I have, you know, this is an energy conference, but a couple of the books are, you know, basically relating to transforming consciousness. Um, now on a, you know, a little more down-to-earth kind of side, um, some things that have come along to kind of put this uh, field forward that I think is a really disruptive technology. It's completely awesome. I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but for example, 3D printing, you know, besides the internet, that's obviously disrupted a lot of things and has leveled the playing field. But 3D printing is something that is also leveling the playing field. People can just set, you know, set, set it up and start manufacturing their own parts. And um, you know, probably a handful of you in here probably have experience with 3D printers. Uh, another thing is uh, crowdfunding. Crowdfunding works. That's another disruptive technology, really, because people are coming in and they're bypassing investors. I mean, for years, a lot of people who have something that they want to develop have, uh, you know, the thing has always been, how do we get the money to do this and that, and it's a whole investment game. But with the crowdfunding, you bypass all that, go straight to the people, and when something appeals to uh, somebody enough, and you really, you know, touch somebody, then, uh, you know, it moves them to action, and they will, you know, gladly be a part of it. And we've seen a lot of success in that. Um, for example, in January, with crowdfunding, has anybody followed Eric Dollard's uh, advanced seismic warning system? Okay, so we were able to raise $25,000 in uh, one month to help pay for the, uh, uh, the bond for the land, the performance bond for the land uh, that the project is going on. And a lot of that money, I don't know if you followed some of the pictures on ericpdollar.com, but there's been a lot of work that, you know, we haven't talked about on the internet a lot, but we just released a lot of photos when Eric came up here showing what the money is actually being applied to. They've repaired a lot of these poles that these uh, uh, electrostatic antennas are gonna go on for this uh, earthquake forecasting system. And so, you know, with crowdfunding also comes res uh, with responsibility. And I see a lot of junk being put out there that people are trying to, you know, abuse, ab they're abusing people. They're putting these projects out there that they know they don't work or they're hoping they will and they're misrepresenting them and they're asking for a lot of money from people and they're taking in a lot of money but they don't really have a plan or have really any idea what they're doing. And so getting involved with crowdfunding, make sure it's something that that you know what you're doing, you have a definite plan, just like you know Eric and uh, EP, uh, EPD Labs has. It's a very specific process with this much money, this is what we're doing with it, we're working on the polls, we're gonna do this, and, and have that mapped out. And make sure that all that is already kind of mapped out and you know what you're gonna do with it before you even get started. And um, so, you know, besides anything relating to uh, raising our awareness, the 3D printing and um, crowdfunding, that's two things that, you know, that, that's really on our side. So that, that's, I'll pass it on to Eric. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have such a romantic view of the situation. <laughs> the human race and its integrated level of consciousness has never been at such a low point. Uh, everybody has just basically turned into a barbarian. Nobody's interested in anything. We all here represent some .00001% anomalous species. Uh, there is no future for the human race on its uh, present course. It's gonna be annihilated. So uh, at any rate, those of you who were unfortunate enough to breed, uh, 
you are stuck with an interesting situation of uh, you have brought another human being into a living hell. And you better figure out a way to deal with it. That's all I can say. Well, that's kind of a, a, a pessimist point of view. It's a scientific point of view. I, I'm more of an optimist, personally. <laughs> um, I, uh, how I feel is technology is only gonna get us halfway there to a better world. Um, it's got to start with yourselves, to be honest. Uh, what got us into this mess in the first place is people focusing on their own wants and needs and not caring about other people as much. <clears throat> and technology will definitely help, but to create a better world, you have to start looking beyond yourself and caring about your, your neighbor and being as kind to them as you would be to yourself. I'm a firm believer that everything in your life happens for a reason. And any experience you've had in your life, you have brought to yourself in order to learn something. And it's very important to learn that lesson whenever it comes to you, even if the situation is not something you like. It's, it's uh, incredibly important to learn that lesson and take that with you and teach it to somebody else. That's all I have to say. Keep your day job. <laughs> this great transition that uh, my colleagues are referring to is going to take decades to, to manifest. In that time, uh, you're going to have to maintain uh, paying the rent and paying the insurance on your car and everything else that's required to uh, survive. If you're deeply interested in, in this very novel field, that means you're going to have to do it in an incremental step at a time. I've, I've seen various uh, passionate researchers over the years uh, sell the farm, hawk their car, buy equipment, put everything into whatever it is they think they're working, and, and then wonder why their wife leaves them. Um, if you read just one book a year, or one article a year, or a couple articles a month, a very s slow but incremental and improving collection of information and understanding of what's going on, you'll be in a position, say, speaking 10, 20 years from now, having this broad background of all this technology and all this science and the uh, exploits of uh, the pioneers in the field. You'll be much better positioned to make a contribution when the opportunity comes, especially if you're doing experiments in the basement and you already know that you can't do this and you can't do this and this works and that works and this is really interesting. You know what's, what's going on and how, how to really help out with this grand scheme of things. Uh, as far as I can, I can see that if there is any huge transformation in the way in which in energy is distributed in this uh, world, it's going to have to be done from a grassroots level. Whatever we do is going to have to be very simple, can be built in somebody's uh, kitchen or living room or basement and, and put together with parts that are readily available. Anything beyond that is going to be um, beyond the masses to utilize, or it's going to be controlled by the present powers that be. And in order to be a part of this kind of a revolution, it's going to take time and it's going to have to be done very incrementally using the internet and these other uh, resources we have. But think in terms of decades, not next year or the year after that or the next uh, presidential election. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Do we have a helper to take this microphone down into the audience? Oh, we've got one out there. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, anybody, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, let's, let's take some questions anybody from the audience. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, I know many people here have heard of Jerry Vasilitas, and you wrote a book called Lost Science. And uh, in it, it talks about many, many people's research. And, you know, throughout the last hundred years, people have come through and done all kinds of research. 
The problem comes in is in development. And I see an example here that went on this weekend where people are not thinking in the box regarding development. And my, my question is to Jim Murray and Paul, regarding your need to have a patent for your device. Now, the, the market for your device would probably be in the hundreds of millions, if not more. Why do you need a patent protection for such a device? You can make it, you're ahead of the ball, you can make it, and you can't possibly make that many for the, uh, for the world. And if other people get into the game, so what? That's not what it's about, sir. That's not what it's about, sir. Modern patent law is very corrupt like everything else. And let me tell you what will really happen. If we just start giving the information out with all good intention, you'll have some big XYZ corporation come along and they will file patents and they will do whatever the hell they want to do with the technology and you won't have anything to say about it. <coughs> that's, that's not the way it works. That's not true, though, for pa uh, public domain. No, in 2009, that changed. I got something to say. Something has to be dedicated to public domain. I got something to say. There's a... Okay, uh, I, I, I know exactly what's going on with this. Uh, what these people are about is to make sure none of this stuff ever happens and to knock your brain off course. Now, I've spotted a motive going on in this by some of these so-called Tesla experts is when I start coming up with like an idea or a theory on the Tesla stuff and start coming up with algebraic equations and concepts, what these cunning reptiles are doing is they're sneaking off and patenting every one of these things, whether they know how it operates or not. And when it comes time for me to hitch up with the Navy or hitch up with the power company or whatever to get this stuff gone the way that it's supposed to get gone, they're going to come out of the woodwork and they're going to say they got a patent on it and it ain't going to happen. So you better damn well get your patent first. That's all I got to say. I mean, this is uh, what's going on. I, I want to say, hold on, I got something to say about it too. I'll give you a perfect example of exactly what happened to me. Can you hear this okay? Yeah. Anybody follow the water spark plug thread when that first started going on about 2008 or so? Water, did, water spark plug thread, basically the plasma ignition. Did I or did I not share everything in that forum with what I'm going on, what you saw here this weekend, and what's in my ignition secrets package? I thought I was open sourcing it. I thought I was putting it in the public domain. Yeah. When I wrote the book to explain this so somebody didn't have to take thousands of hours going through it, I was going to give a dedication to somebody who had their own contribution that was different than mine. So I typed his name into Google to make sure I was spelling his name right, and the first thing that came up in the, in the uh, Google search was a patent application for my invention. Okay? But isn't his patent easy to break because you his patent, it's my invention. Just, okay, okay, wait, just, just hold. Let me, for, 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 first, his, first of all, it's not his patent. They applied for it, it's my invention, and it was filed within one year because if you put something in the public domain, okay, there's a one year period that you have to still file the patent. So people are gonna think if you see something that goes, it's automatically public domain and it's everybody's, no, you still have one year to file for that patent. And that's exactly what they did, claiming that they were the inventors, okay? And so what I did, what, what's that gonna do? They patent it and then I'm gonna be barred from doing anything commercial with my own invention? Forget that. You know, I, I'm not gonna put up with that. So what I did was, well, I basically confronted them and I kind of threw their lawyer around a little bit 
And then several months later, after a heated battle, I get to share the patent with three other people and three other assignees on the patent who have absolutely nothing to do with what I created. Okay? So all this thing about, well, let's give it out to the world for free, and let's give it out. You don't need to do the patent and this and that. In some situations, you need it, and you need to educate yourselves on exactly what that process is. I got screwed by it, but I was aggressive enough in not putting up with people's BS that, you know, I stood my ground and went after it. So that's the only reason my name is on it, and I can do whatever I want with it. So there's a lot of misinformation about what people think patents are about, and they, most people have it wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this, yeah this, uh, this goes back to um, uh, another real situation that happened when I was working with John in 2004 and 2005. And I'm sure many of you uh, remember uh, uh, a, a place on the internet called JLN Labs. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jean-Louis Naudin and uh, an amazing... Um, uh, laboratory in France who was uh, doing everything they possibly could to duplicate you know other people's uh, technology and vet them and and, and it, it all on the, on the surface of this uh, it all looked like you know this wonderful open source um, situation that and, and this guy was just an amazing resource and he was helping everybody out and he was sh teaching us all what worked and what didn't work and everything else and uh, that was the general understanding of what that was. Um, as John and I started looking into uh, a number of patenting situations, what we found was really going on was that that guy was being funded by um, a, a situation where he was going in and checking out everything and filing patents in France on everything that he duplicated and found out worked. That is what JLN Labs was about. And we, we ended up just uh, calling him the miner. Okay? Um, and there isn't anything pleasant or wonderful or supportive or open source or uh, anything that is useful about that kind of behavior. And it was absolutely pervasive. And um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think on, on this panel we all have a pretty clear, um, you know, we, are, uh, we, we recognize the limitations of the patent system, but we are also extremely pro-protect uh, of the intellectual property. Yeah. I just got, my company and I, we just got our, fifth, our 15th patent. And when you're trying to take technology to the world, that means you have to be a businessman. It means you have to raise money, investment. It's just how the world works. You know, sometimes we have to deal with reality. So I spent 13 years building a multi-million dollar company where we've, so when you take people's money as investment money, if you don't have your patent portfolios, your company doesn't hold it, you will never raise a dime because people don't invest, invest money to not make money. And without patent protections, it, your, your technology will never go to the marketplace. It's just how it works. And it's just a harsh reality we have to deal with as inventors. And you know that's how it is. So for the protection of my stockholders, my employees, and all the people that have put their life's work into it, the patents are key and critical. And just because somebody has something patented doesn't mean you can't learn about it. Does John Bedini not have a handful of patents regarding his technology? And he's up here sharing with everybody how it exactly works and is uh, given the blessing to you know, learn, learn about it, you know, make it for your own personal use and, and have fun with it. And you know, these guys are doing the same thing. You know? So just because something is patented doesn't mean the inventor is not going to be supportive of you learning about different principles and stuff, what it's about, so. You can actually use any patent for yourself, so long as you don't commercialize. So, uh, from the opposite end of it. <laughs> uh, I have beaten my brains out on the energetic form, showing people how to actually build working Tesla transmission systems where 
they can actually derive usable power from their local AM radio station, which I don't think the radio station would be enthused about. <laughs> but the whole idea was to, uh, ham, a ham radio operator overturns Einstein for $100. But no one was really interested. I came up with circuits and, and diagrams and methods to prove Tesla's cosmic ray theory. Spent months and months on this, countless hours wandering around in the wilderness, picking up data in my head on how to do this and struggling with the ideas and all that. I put this thing out in the energetic form. Not one person has duplicated it. I have come up with Van Tassel's circuits to duplicate possible things that would have happened at the Integratron, countless ideas and equations and circuses, and no one could give a flying foxtrot. So what good is it to put it out in the public domain? We have a few more minutes for questions, and we'd like to ask that you uh, give your name and where you're from when you take the mic. I'm Victor from Spokane. And uh, my question is, once you have a patent, you can still put it out in public domain and you're protecting that technology that way, aren't you? Well, technically speaking, a patent winds up placing the information in the public domain, but it theoretically recognizes the, uh, the ownership of the IP to the, in to the inventor or to the assignee. So it's the best of both worlds because it sort of does both. Got it. Thanks. From my experience with the Radio Corporation of America, uh, you know, who basically uh, patented it out everybody and uh, drove every inventor to oblivion that had a competing patent, uh, there was an interesting thing that struck me is all the two boxes had uh, what was called a license notice on it. And what was interesting is you could take one of RCA's tube designs that was patented and uh, any ham radio operator or experimenter was free to use that tube for whatever circuit or whatever purpose he wanted, but if you were going to make money off of it, then you had to be licensed by RCA. So that's kind of an interesting situation is the individual is not blocked, but the the money-making corporation or, or individual that wants to make money off his buck. So it's not really, the experimenter and the individual is not really cut out in the situation. So there is uh, kind of that angle on it that I'd like to throw in. Any other topics that you'd like to throw at the panel? Over here. Yes. Uh, I just want to make some comments. You know, the constitutional patent law the purpose of it is to transfer technology from the inventor to the public domain. That's the purpose in the Constitution. With the 17-year patent period given to the inventor for the exclusive right to sue, that's, that's about all there is with the patent, is the right to sue and protect that invention as exclusive use for 17 years. Uh, if someone uh, secrets the technology in the patent away, it can be patented uh, a second time, can be patented right over that if they don't use it, if they don't develop it. So there's a lot of this stuff that's being grabbed by corporations just for the purpose of sitting on it. But there again, what you're left with is uh, you've got to have a really good attorney to uh, fight for it because the person with the best attorney or the best you know, legal team is going to fight anybody even if they, you know, it's like uh, Tesla's uh, General Electric claimed a patent right over uh, that little electric meter on your house based on a Tesla patent which didn't mention it. And they enforced it for, you know, years uh, for those electric meters. So, you know, they did that with having better attorneys, more money, and so forth. Uh, I've heard, and I'm, I'm exploring the idea, that proprietary information can be protected under intellectual rights without a patent. If you copyright it, uh, they can be violating your copyright if they copy your patent and uh, file a patent application on it. I've had a number of people who've patented, patented several of my inventions and uh, 
uh, it was the same thing. You know, somebody calls you up, and next thing you know, they're filing a patent application on it. So, you know, it's something's got to be done about it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, I, th I think we better wrap it up. Come to the end, end of our time. I uh, really appreciate everybody's questions and very much appreciate this panel. And I'm still an optimist because mm -hmm. I've uh, watched this field for more than 30 years, almost as long as some people like Jim and, and Peter. And uh, I do see progress. I, I do see, I've never seen a demonstration before of uh, more <laughs> power back to the source than, than uh, coming from it. Um, what, what you people have uh, been witness to this weekend is truly paradigm changing and, and it's, uh, it's just a, you are really in, on, in a wonderful time. And that's, I'll wrap it up with that. Hey, by the way, this is a, for me, this is a personal dream come true, being up here with all these guys and all of you have helped make that possible, so thank you. Hey.